Father, we thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, two weeks ago, I spoke about how we all make hypocrites of ourselves at one point or another. Has anyone managed to not become a hypocrite this week? Now just gone? No? That's, ooh, I almost thought I saw a hand up then, but I think she was more playing with her husband's hair. <laughs> Hearing aids. That was, that was going to be my next guess. But we all make hypocrites of ourselves at one point or another because we are all on a journey from forgiveness and justification through to sanctification, becoming more and more like Jesus himself. For the vast majority of Christ followers, sanctification is a lifelong process, meaning that we do still sin, don't we? We're all still sinners. We might be um, justified, we've all been made righteous in Christ, but we still get things wrong from time to time. We will still stuff up and make hypocrites of ourselves. Hopefully, though, this happens less and less as we grow older in our faith, not just in age, but particularly as we grow older in our faith and in our love for Jesus. It is a process, a process of changing and allowing our minds to be led by the Holy Spirit. See, it's not just a matter of just sitting there and hoping that we grow like a mushroom does after rain. Mushrooms aren't good for much, are they? They're good to eat if you get the right ones. Yes, they are, Carmel. <laughs> Especially cooked in a bit of butter. Yeah. yeah. Now you're all wanting some, <laughs> some food. Fungus. fungus. Yeah. We all eat fungus. <laughs> we all eat... Uh, if you want to talk about what we, we should and shouldn't eat, we were watching a show last night uh, where they were showing how you can turn crickets into to meal. And, um, yeah. <laughs> now that you don't want to eat anymore, <laughs> you'll focus back on me. <laughs> We need to allow the Holy Spirit to do the changing. We have to be open to what the Holy Spirit tells us. But as I said two weeks ago, this morning isn't so much reminding you of this, but reminding us what we need to do and how we can particularly do it. And so the first way that we can do it is remembering that there is life through the Spirit. So if you have your Bible, if you'd like to turn to Romans chapter 8, I particularly love this passage of scripture. So I think it covers the full breadth of life, full breadth of what we go through at times. So Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verses 1 to 14. It says that, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. If you're in Christ Jesus this morning, there is no condemnation for you, none whatsoever. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the to the Spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the Spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. In other words, if you don't follow Jesus, it doesn't matter what you do, it will never be good enough to satisfy God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the Spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his Spirit who lives in you. 
Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it is not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Earlier in Romans, Paul writes that there is a war raging within him. It's in the end of of chapter 7 before he gets to this passage. He says he knows what is right, but the flesh tries to condemn him. In other words, in his mind, he knows what God says. He knows what God expects of him. But his body continues to do those things that he knows he not ought to do. Anyone know that feeling? I often get to a point where I have to remind myself, think on uh, the particular things that the Word of God says. So what does he say to think upon? All that's good, all that's pure, all that's righteous, all that's holy. Basically, whatever is good, think on these things. What does our minds tend to think about? Other things, yeah. (laughs) How I'm going to get back at somebody. How I'm annoyed at somebody. How somebody just cut me off. How so-and-so should have said this to me and they didn't. Why didn't I get thanked for doing what I did? Our minds get caught in all these kinds of things, don't they? We don't often sit there thinking about, how can I challenge somebody to love and good deeds? What can I do to make somebody's life a little bit easier? What can I do to draw closer to Jesus? How often do we find ourselves sitting there thinking about those things without physically putting time aside? Actually, you can't physically put time aside, can you? Without blocking time aside to sit with the Word of God and to think about those things. It doesn't often come naturally. But God's Word says we should do it naturally. And Paul writes about this. He says there's this battle going on. I want to do this, but I don't do that. And the things I don't want to do, I tend to do. Like him, we need to recognize that with justification, so when we are made right with God, we become free from condemnation. Isn't that an amazing thing that God has given us? That there is now no condemnation for you. That doesn't mean that the police can't pull you over and give you a speeding ticket because you've done the wrong thing. You can't pull out your Bible and say, but God says there's no condemnation for me now. You have to keep that. There is still a punishment for doing the wrong things. But God is not going to, to get to the end of our life and say, sorry, you didn't do enough. You weren't quite good enough. You didn't recite enough scripture or learn enough of it off by heart. So you can't come in. He says there's no condemnation, not from him, not from anybody in the heavenly realm, and nobody from the hellish realm as well. Satan won't be able to go up to God and say, you see see Paul standing at the gate there? Don't let him in. He's one of mine. Satan won't be able to do that because God will say, sorry, he's mine. There is no condemnation for him. But we have to accept that too, don't we? Because when we accept that there's no no condemnation, it changes what we do. It changes how we think and feel about things. It means when somebody does the wrong thing to us, we can say to ourselves, we don't have to say, that's okay, but we can say, I'm not going to allow that to change how I think and feel about things. Paul says the law of God reminds us of what sin is, but we are no longer ruled by it. The mind is now governed by the Spirit of God, bringing peace and life. Do you feel peaceful this morning? Some are saying yes. Some of us are probably thinking about the next week and what's got to happen and We get a bit worked up about that because there's so much going on and how am I going to get through it all and I'm just so tired. And That may be true, but God says we can find peace. We don't have to let it rule how we feel. The Bible says that you are no longer condemned. In fact, you are now conquerors. 
every one of you is a conqueror. Do you feel like a conqueror today? Most of us would say no. And there's a reason why. Michael, without realising it, I think gave us some of that answer this morning when he read the passage from Ephesians chapter 6. What does Paul say there for us to do? Well, that's the right part. I was going to say, I was reminded, do not exasperate your children. (laughs) (laughs) Your children are growing up. doesn't mean you can't exasperate them still. (laughs) But we are to put on the full armour of God. Oftentimes we put on the bits that are are comfortable and easy to carry, but we don't put it all on. We might not like the helmet because it makes us feel constricted. Or we might not pick up the sword of the Spirit, which is the Bible, because, well, it's too heavy and the words are too small. I can't read it. I don't understand it. Don't like the thongs or, or whatever. We only put on parts of it or we don't put on any of it. And then we wonder why the fiery darts keep getting through while we keep experiencing these painful moments that God says we don't have to experience. We are conquerors. Not because we're good enough, but because Jesus has already conquered. What did he conquer? The world? Death? I was going to say, he didn't just conquer the world, he conquered beyond the world. He conquered beyond the physical. He did conquer sin and death, the physical things that we see, but he conquered the spiritual as well. Hell has no place reserved for for you anymore. Satan does not have any claim over you anymore. Death has no claim over you anymore. We don't have to fear it. We don't have to be all worked up by what's going to happen. Sure, we have no control over how it's going to come. But what happens at that moment when our heart stops and we open our spiritual eyes, what a moment that's going to be. What a moment when we see Jesus and we recognise that all that stuff we worried about in this life, it's pointless because it can't come with us. We are conquerors. That feeling of condemnation, however you might feel it, that you're not good enough, that you're not worthy enough, that you're not attractive enough or smart enough or rich enough for whatever it is, whatever is holding you down, whatever is keeping you in that place that you hate being. It's a result of Satan's lies. It's all it is. It is Satan whispering things to you that you're choosing to believe instead of listening to the voice of the one who is the author of your life. The one who said that he made you exactly how he wants you to be at this point in time. The one who says that he is still growing you, who's changing you, who's making you more and more into his image. That's the voice we should be listening to, isn't it? The voice of the spirit that is inside our lives. The one who speaks to our spirit. But our spirit likes to say, hey, Holy Spirit, you you just wait over there. I'm going to listen to this spirit here because I don't like what he's saying, but I'll believe it. I like what you're saying, but I'm not going to believe it. How backwards do we get things, don't we? Because we buy into the lies. The only one who can condemn says that you are free. God is the only one with the power to condemn you. And he gave that that power to his son. And what does Jesus say? All who come to me, I won't let go of them. All who love me, I go and prepare a place for them. Do we believe that? Do you believe that there's a place being prepared for you right now in heaven, in eternity? Because Jesus says so. So why do we listen to the voice that says all you've got is what you've got right now? And if you don't get enough, then you're never going to be happy enough. When we start chasing those things, that's when we make hypocrites of ourselves, don't we? Because we say we believe this stuff, and yet we live a totally different way. That's what a hypocrite is. 
But Jesus says you have life eternal. He says nothing can ever separate you from his love. That's not just words. That's a fact. That is something that we can trust in the hardest and our deepest of problems that we go through. It is a fact. But the first thing that we need to do is we need to accept that fact as truth. It's not one of these facts that the world says is a fact until they manipulate it to turn it into something else. That's how wars are started, isn't it? You said so and so, but but that's not what I meant, but that's what you said. We have to accept that what Jesus says is truth. Because when we accept it as truth, we can then allow it to make a difference. But the second thing, if you've accepted what Jesus says as fact, then the next part comes. We need to accept God fully. We need to accept Jesus fully. We need to accept the Holy Spirit fully. All to Jesus, I surrender. All to him, I freely give. Who can say that they give freely to Jesus? Most of us give begrudgingly, don't we? If I have to give it to you, Jesus, well, just wait till I'm finished with it and then you can have it. Let me just get to the end of my rope and then I'll come to you and say, oh, Lord, help me. Let me do it for myself. Have you ever noticed that how you act towards something is often conditional upon your attitude? Take this morning, for example, when the first song was playing. How many of us got up or sat if you had to sit, but how many of us worshipped fully? And how many of us um, sung along but because we're feeling tired and it's been a long week and that it's like, uh, we don't, not really, our heart really wasn't in it. It's the same with the relationships that we have too, isn't it? When we're happy, then we act happy and we're glad to be around people and we'll talk to them and, and we'll talk about positive things. But when we're tired, how many of us are really talkative then and are upbeat about things and think life is great? when you're struggling to to get sleep. None of us really, hey? If you're grumpy, you often act and think negatively. If you're joyful, you act far better. When you love something fully, you're changed by it. If you really love something, it makes a change in your life, doesn't it? You change the way you live to be able to get more and more of that particular thing. So if you love money, you're going to work hard, aren't you? You'll do whatever you can to get more and more money. If you like big houses, you're going to save as much as you can till you can get that big house or the car or the computer or whatever it is. I was going to say MP3 players, but they don't do them anymore, do they? That's all on our phones to get the the latest phone, to keep updating it. If you love Jesus, aren't you going to do everything you can to get to know him more and more, to have more and more of him in your life? And the more you have him, the more he comes back out. If we wonder why we haven't seen the blessings of Jesus, it may well be because we're not actually getting enough of Jesus in our life to see the blessings come out again. That's not to say that blessing is conditional on how much time we spend with Jesus. But the more we draw close to him, I can guarantee you the more he will change you. The more you might be blessed internally, not necessarily externally. But he will change you. See, many only accept Jesus in part and so are tossed about like a boat in a storm never finding the safe harbour. Paul writes in Romans 12 verse 1 that a clear view and love of God will naturally result in our offering ourselves fully to he who fully offered himself for us. I'll say that again. A clear, Romans 12 1 says that a clear view and love of God will naturally result in our offering ourselves fully to he who fully offered himself for us. 
In other words, if you see Jesus clearly, if you see him in all his glory, there is nothing else that you would rather do but to draw close to him. If you saw God the way Paul saw God, the way he writes about him, if you saw him that clearly, you would want to be with him. You, you would tell him, forget this world, I want to be where you are. Isn't that what the disciples did as well? Lord, we want to know the place that you're going to. They wanted to stay with him as long as they could. They wanted to be around him. They wanted to drink in all that knowledge, all that wisdom, all that love that he gave out. Jesus is our example. But where does that offering start though? If it says that we're to offer ourselves fully to him, where does that offering start? See, verse 2 suggests it's not with our actions. It's not about getting up from this place and going out and finding the first poor person you can and giving all your money to them. That's not going to change your life. It might change theirs, but it's not going to change yours. And, but we often do that, don't we? We get all gung-ho and excited about what Jesus has done for us, so we try to find something to, to do. And when that doesn't change who we are, what happens? Don't we do less of it? Well, if that didn't work, I'm not doing that again. It made me happy for a little bit, but well, that happiness disappeared. So why do it? That's what the world says to do. Keep doing stuff. The more you do, the better you're going to feel about yourself. It doesn't work, does it? It just makes you feel worse about yourself because what you're expecting to get in return, you don't get. And so you give up. But Jesus he says, don't start with your actions, start with your thinking. Start with how you think about things. It is the way we seek to understand, how we interpret, how we justify ourselves, and how we handle the dichotomies of life. So, for example, Christianity tells us that we are citizens of heaven that our citizenship does not belong in this world, that we are citizens of heaven. And our past goes back to a group of refugees seeking asylum in Egypt. If we look at the history of the church, we know it goes back to the Jewish people. And where were they? They were stuck in Egypt for a long time. That's part of our history. That's part of who we are as a people. But many Christians also hold to keeping the borders closed, believing that if we should be left to others, sorry, believing that it should be left to others to do the caring. Don't put me near sick people. I want to stay well. That's somebody else's problem, not mine. And I'm not just talking about coronavirus, asylum seekers and that as well. Christians are often seen as hypocrites in that, that we preach love, but don't come here. This is our country. We own this place. And then we wonder why the indigenous people then get cranky at us as well. Because they say, no, this is our place, not your place. You came and stole it from us. No wonder we're not seen very well by the world around us. But this is a dichotomy where we say one thing or believe one thing and we do another. Our inward self does not match our outward self. As Christians, we need to not only examine the issues involved, whatever the topic is, we also need to examine our own thought processes, our beliefs and prejudices, and most importantly, what the Word of God has to say. When I did that, when it came to Aboriginal people in this area, I think a while ago when we had um, Dion, I think it was, Dion, yeah, the Aboriginal church came and shared with us. And I said to them there, in front of you all, that I'd realised, or came to a realisation that I was actually racist. Now, I wouldn't have called myself that, but when I stopped and considered um, the way I thought about um, the Aboriginal people, what I thought about the issues that went on with them, how I acted around them, and then what the Word of God says about them as well, and how we're called to love people, Notice that the Word of God never says, only love certain people. We're to care about everyone. I realised that my actions 
and my thoughts particularly did not line up with my beliefs. And something had to change. Does that mean it changed overnight? No, I still struggle. But I know the Word of God, I know the Holy Spirit in my life is winning over my mind. We all have to do that, don't we? On any issue, we need to stop and consider, what is it that I think about this? Where did I get this, these thoughts from? Why do I believe whatever it is? And is that right? Not Is it right because the people in my community or the people in my workplace or the people in my family say it, but because the Word of God says it? Because that is the only thing that we can measure against. The only thing that can ever condemn us is the Word of God. And thankfully, because God says that we're not condemned, He will help us to change. But only if we accept Him fully. In the end, we have to change to conform to God's word, not what, what, not what is popular or what we are comfortable with. And we have to keep doing it over and over again until we speak truth in love. It's not a one-time deal. We have to keep doing it. We have to keep checking our thoughts. We have to keep checking our emotions. We have to keep checking the words that come out of our mouth before they come out of our mouth. Because once they're out... We all know it's too late. But before I say a particular thing, is this going to be interpreted badly? Is this going to be hurtful to the other person? It's like going up to a lady and asking, how pregnant are you? Is there ever a good time to ask that question? The only good time to ask that question is when you know for certain that they are pregnant. And said a friend of ours is pregnant and so I can keep asking her, so how many weeks are you now? And I'm not going to get a backhand for calling her fat because she is changing in size. But sometimes these things come out of our mouths, don't we? That we ask particular things because to us, that's normal how you say that. I don't mean anything by it. But how's the other person going to hear it? How are they going to interpret it? Because we don't know their experiences. We don't know what they've been through and how they might hear something. And so we have to rely on the Spirit of God there as well. So we need life through the Spirit, accept God fully, and the third one, love in action. So what does a life free from hypocrisy look like? Well, I can tell you, but I want to let God speak for himself. And so turn to Romans 12, verses 9 to 21. Because God here says exactly what a life free of hypocrisy looks like for the Christian person. He says there, love must be sincere. That's what he starts with. There must be no falsehood in you. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honour one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal or passion, but keep your spiritual fervour serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone, especially in God's eyes, and most importantly, in his. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. 
If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And finally, do not be overcome by evil. Do not listen to evil. Do not even entertain the thoughts of evil. But overcome evil with good. What is good? God is good. God is the only one who will overcome evil. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Or as the LNT, the NLT says, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. You are more than a conqueror. You know what you really are? And I can say this about you all. You are children of God. There is no greater title that you can ever be given than to be called a child of God. And that is each one of you. Redeemed by his blood, sealed with the Holy Spirit, and made brand new. How do we stop being hypocrites? We believe God. Go and live as such. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we can listen to what you have to say about us and to know that it's not only true, but it makes a real difference in our lives. That we are no longer to be overcome by evil, but that through you, We are good, we have good, and we belong to good. Lord, when we run into those times this week, when we start to to act hypocritically, where we start to act in ways that are outside of the word of God, when we believe the lies of Satan and choose to do what he says rather than what you say, Lord, draw us back to these words. Remind us once again that we have no condemnation upon us, that we are the children of God and that we have the Holy Spirit in our life to lead the way for us. Lord, may we be the example to a world that sees Christians as hypocrites. May we be the example of the opposite, to be the example of Christ in this world. Father, lead us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to stand as we sing our final song, The Wonderful Cross, that cross that led us to him, that allows us to come to him, that changes us.